Welcome to season two of The Influencers. We've expanded our scope to bring you interviews with some of the most interesting and thoughtful voices from the digitally driven seismic transformation happening at the intersection of law, business and technology. We'll be sharing with you the rapidly evolving information that you need to know. Hi everyone, I'm Tala Arshad, a counsel in the Hogan Lovell's Public Law and Policy team in London. And I'm here today with Ryan Dolby Stevens, who I've known for a long time and is now the head of AI and algorithms in Uber's EMEA legal function. Today, we're going to talk about Ryan's new role, the sorts of things he's now having to grapple with, and the challenges of regulating a technology like AI, which is moving so quickly, as everyone knows, and in relation to which there is broad consensus that regulation is absolutely critical for the public interest but a huge divergence of views on how you do it. To get started, Ryan, before we get into the really difficult stuff about regulating AI, just on a personal note, what's the development in AI that you've been most excited about in the past few months? Hi, Tella. Uh, great to be here. Thanks very much for having me on. I think, uh, you know, like many people, it's kind of hard not to be enthralled by the recent developments in generative AI. So in particular, some of the stuff that we're seeing coming out around image and video generation tools been released in recent months is all super exciting. And these are absolutely fascinating and they kind of feel almost magical to behold sometimes. Though uh, as a lawyer, you kind of can't help but... Uh, worry about the IP implications of that, which are quite distracting. Personally, I'm very eager to see how the case law on that all develops in the next few years. I think there are a few high profile cases underway already. I also saw recently a company developed a humanoid robot actually making a coffee in early January. And whilst we see advances in robotics all the time, and and they're amazing, the interesting thing here was that the robot supposedly had no kind of prior coffee making instructions given to it. It learnt the task by observing a human making the coffee first. Although with all that said, I think I always try and take these demonstrations with a bit of a pinch of salt, having seen a few of them being debunked in recent weeks. The robot in question here, I think, supposedly spent 10 hours studying a video as part of its learning process. You can imagine turning up to a new job and spending 10 hours learning to use the coffee machine. I think your your new boss might have to start second guessing their hiring decision in that situation. <laughs> that is amazing. That's a great story. And it's sort of illustrative of, I suppose, a, a desire to promote AI products. And, the, and obviously, there's so much happening in this space and so much innovation. But there is also, you know, a bit of second checking to do about the stories that are out there on what AI is now capable of. So just to get into the, you know, your new role and the sorts of things you're thinking about, you're obviously thinking about lots of different emerging regulatory frameworks across the jurisdictions in EMEA you're now covering. Can you give us a sense of how they vary and how you're preparing for for the introduction of these you know, very different regulatory regimes? Yeah, of course. Happy to. So I think probably, you know, one of the main challenges is actually staying on top of everything. The underlying technology is moving pretty damn quickly, but the regs themselves are also still emerging and developing. So uh, 2024 certainly showing no sign of letting up on that front. I think in terms of emerging regulatory frameworks, they seem to be rallying into kind of two camps at the moment. So on the one hand, we're seeing the lighter principles based system like we're seeing in the UK. And then on the other hand, you have kind of more prescriptive regimes, which are kind of more risk based and really kind of laying down much more prescriptive guidelines about what will and won't be allowed. And obviously, the EU is is a prime example of that. I think, you know, to some extent, it's helpful that the EU is paving the way globally in, in, in that respect. It's theoretically great for companies from a clarity perspective, but it also is probably going to pose global companies with some tricky geographical and strategic questions. Now, with all that said, I think whilst you've got some variations regionally in how prescriptive different regimes might be, and of course, variations in how large or small the enforcement mechanisms might be as well, the AI Act being an example of one where there's a particularly big stick. All of the regimes which are emerging are sharing some common themes, which are sort of maybe common sense. So we're seeing things like transparency, fairness, safety, security, data protection, human centric design, things like that all seem to be cropping up pretty much everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose a lot of the kind of public discourse, including the 
the discourse amongst politicians on the capabilities of AI and the risks arising from it have focused on, for lack of a better word, existential risks, you know, killer robots and uh, sentient AI. And that all feels in some ways quite close. It's not as far away as we might like to think, but I imagine it's not the kind of thing that is front of mind for you. How much are you thinking about that? And what are actually the more practical considerations around AI that you need to be thinking of? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So obviously there are some AI use cases which are really quite frightening. So autonomous weaponry is is a great example or tools which could be used for kind of mass government surveillance. I think it's human nature and natural that a lot of the public discussion is going to be focused on these sort of doomsday type scenarios. And at the same time, it's also really important for regulators to be appropriately preparing for those worst case scenarios. But as, as you rightly point out, I think most of that stuff is not going to be applicable for most companies. And so there's a slight tendency for the real uh, sort of day to day concerns about the application of AI to our everyday lives to be overlooked in some ways. So in terms of how companies like Uber are preparing, whilst we've not got the AI Act 100% settled yet, it's still a bit of a challenge knowing exactly how that's going to bite on us in a sort of a day-to-day practical way. But there are things that we can be doing at this stage. And I think things like ensuring that you're fully across all the existing ways in which your organization is using AI, ensuring that your documentation and governance processes are all appropriately tight and fit for purpose. Those are the sorts of exercises that people can be doing proactively now, which will pave the way for the later stages of more detailed impact assessments and implementation of compliance programs once we've got a little bit more clarity on on the direction that the regs are going in. And you mentioned the EU AI Act. That obviously sets out a, a very detailed and in some ways prescriptive regulatory framework and there are detailed rules in there. As someone now leading the EMEA AI and algorithms team at Uber, what are the other key regulatory issues you're thinking about aside from what's in the EU AI Act? For example, transparency is a standard that is seen as a key element of the safe and responsible development and deployment of AI technology. And it's the kind of thing that will probably be a common thread across every AI regulatory regime. On transparency specifically, do you see any challenges in defining that concept as a regulatory standard in the AI context? Yeah, I mean, what a great question. I think transparency is a really, really interesting one. Speaking personally, I think transparency is is a good thing fundamentally, and I'm fully supportive of it. I think it does pose a couple of key challenges, though. The first one, which is sort of not really a new concept in the domain of transparency, is going to be around protection of confidential information and trade secrets. So companies and their lawyers will naturally be anxious to protect their competitive advantage and not undermine themselves by accidentally revealing too much about the inner workings of their hard-won technical capability in a way that means that competitors can easily replicate that. And so I think that means that regulators are going to need to think very carefully about how best to balance the need to give people, users, the general public an appropriate level of access to information about how data is being used, but whilst also incentivizing continued innovation and and continuing to foster that. The second challenge with transparency is a bit of a newer problem and is arguably becoming even more complex in the AI world, and that's around explainability. So machine learning models can be extremely complicated and by their very nature, black box in design. So in that context, what does transparency really mean? I think as we've seen the GDPR, we've seen an increasing trend for companies being required to try and explain things to users and data subjects in lay terms. And I think that sort of concept is likely to carry over into the world of AI transparency as well. And so I think, you know, in practical terms, engineers and developers are going to have to start almost thinking about starting at the end and and bearing this explainability problem in mind when designing new systems. But I can see some challenges uh, on the road ahead for companies and their lawyers in this space. Yeah, and quite a lot of back and forth between lawyers and engineers, I can imagine. Indeed, indeed. And in, in terms of kind of other key issues, obviously, without going into it all in too much detail today, aside from transparency, I think companies are going to be watching very closely for finalized requirements around things like 
record keeping and technical documentation. Conformity assessments is something that's kind of been discussed under the AI Act as well. And then also the concept of human oversight. What does that mean in practice and how far will companies have to go to ensure that human oversight is effective? Yeah, absolutely. We talked earlier about the political discourse on AI being often focused on very extreme AI risks rather than the more sort of practical issues businesses need to worry about. Having said that, do you think these moves towards global coordination of AI regulation, and we had the UK government hosted AI Safety Summit in November last year, are those sort of developments positive? And how much of a practical difference can they make to helping a business like Uber make the best of AI systems? Yeah, great question. So I think, you know, I mean, in the current kind of geopolitical climate, any attempt at global cooperation about anything have to be seen as a positive thing, don't they? I mean, you think about things like climate change and uh, other examples where one only hopes that there would be better international cooperation. But with that said, I think a substantial amount of the energy that I've seen so far in this space kind of seems a little bit like it might be political posturing rather than having any tangible harmonisation benefit as yet for global businesses. But it's early, early days. So Arguably, I should stop being so cynical and reserve judgment a while longer. But, you know, international harmonization efforts are notoriously difficult. And I think global businesses uh, like Uber will be thinking all along the same lines, which is that they all need to be meeting the highest regulatory bar among all of the different territories where they do business. So whilst ambitious attempts at cooperation and regulatory conformity are to be welcomed. Businesses can't necessarily split their operations into regional silos. And those businesses will kind of in practice be stuck with having to adhere to the most stringent regimes. And that in itself has an interesting kind of impact on the objectives of those so-called lighter touch regimes, because they're obviously seeking to create a welcoming investment environment for tech companies and, and others. But arguably, if they're only really providing short term benefits for the very smallest startups, maybe their aims aren't quite being met in the way that they would like them to be. That's fascinating because you've obviously got this situation where you could have parallel sets of regulation and even where you have a, a light to touch regime, you're still potentially having to comply with more onerous standards. I wonder, is there an advantage where there's a light to touch regime to do a kind of an initial rollout and kind of test the product before it's exposed to that harsher regulatory environment? And do you think things like regulatory sandboxes and pre-deployment testing, which you know is a, a feature of other regulatory regimes, can that be helpful as a tool for AI regulation for innovators like Uber? Yeah, really interesting one. I think regulatory sandboxes are, in theory, a really brilliant idea. And I think they're mutually beneficial. So you've got for the company or sort of the regulated entity, You've got you're benefiting from advanced and safe access to your regulator's opinion on a given topic. And it's great for the regulators as well, because they get kind of first look access under the hood to cutting edge technological developments within the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. So both of those foster a really great dialogue between both sides, which is, has got to be a good thing in an environment where you're dealing with rapidly developing nascent technology and everyone is sort of learning as they go along to some extent. And I can see things like sandboxes being of real benefit to maybe smaller and medium sized companies, which are not necessarily AI innovators in themselves, but which are being kind of swept up in these seismic industry changes. And for example, they might be buying in AI solutions to target specific problems that they've got. And I think advice and guidance from the relevant regulators there could be really beneficial to those kinds of companies in, in giving them more confidence to embrace this new technology and adopt it in a way that's safe and compliant. I think the one question kind of in my mind about sandboxes and the AI industry is, is pace. So will regulators be adequately funded and technically equipped to move at the same pace as this kind of frighteningly fast paced industry? I think sandboxes work really well where the industry and the regulation is perhaps a little bit more settled, but will they work in, in such a fast moving environment like AI? There is a risk that if companies feel like they're being slowed down by having to explain things to regulators, then they may not bother using things like sandboxes. I mean, personally speaking, I think any opportunity for really good dialogue with your regulator is never a waste of time. But I can see other companies potentially taking a different view there. Yeah, I think I definitely agree with you on that last point. With a challenge as complex as this, 
you need collaboration between regulators and innovators like yourselves who are the first at developing and using these types of products. So I can only see it as beneficial. Ryan, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us and for giving up your time. For everyone listening, please stay tuned for more episodes in this series. We'll be featuring more conversations between members of the Hogan Lovells team and some of the leading influencers in digital transformation. Thanks again, Ryan. Thank you very much for having me. Visit our digital assets and blockchain hub at engagepremium.hoganlovells.com for more podcasts and other resources.